Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video for History Back Podcast. Today, I am joined by Professor Chris Keefe. For those unfamiliar with him, Chris Keefe was the Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at St. Mary's University, where he also serves as Director of the Center for the Social Scientific Study of the Bible. He is now currently Professor at the MF Norwegian School of Theology. His publications include Jesus Against the Scribal Elite, The Origins of the Conflict, Jesus Among Friends and Enemies, A Historical and Literary Introduction to Jesus and the Gospels, and Jesus' Criteria and the Demise of Authenticity. He has also edited many books in the Journal of New Testament Studies. Well, welcome to History Valley Podcast, Professor Keefe. Well, thank you very much. When you discuss Jesus being thought of as literate or illiterate by various people within his audience, why do you think they thought of this regarding to Jesus? Why do you think why do you think different people within his audience had differing opinions about whether he was literate or not? Well, to a certain extent, I think that it's a general condition of uh, the reception of anyone in a pedagogical position. Uh, when you're in the position of a teacher, uh, you know, you're teaching in front of people with different levels of competency. And that was no different in the ancient world than it was today. And the other reason is that the uh, gospel authors outright claim that, that Jesus taught in front of mixed audiences, that his, his audiences, for example, the lost parables of Luke 15 uh, assume that there are uh, Pharisees. Uh, in, that are listening to Jesus teach, while non pharisaic people, uh, more common people, are listening as well. And uh, actually, the, the, those parables turn on the idea that those different audiences are going to interpret those parables differently. So uh, I don't think that there's anything at all historically implausible about the claim that Jesus would have necessarily been teaching and discussing matters of the law uh, in front of audiences of mixed competency. Do you think that Jesus taught, might have taught a new form of Judaism or might have been somewhat Hellenistic leaning, or do you think he was Torah Orthodox? A new form of Judaism? No, absolutely not. Uh, I don't think there's anything in Jesus' teachings that suggest a break with Judaism as he knew it and as it was uh, lived out in his context. Was he Hellenistic leaning? Uh, it, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, I, I would, if, if someone forced me to answer it, I'd say no, uh, because it's, it, it, I don't know, it might be helpful if you clarified what you meant. I mean, to a certain extent, every Jewish person at the time of Jesus was living under Hellenistic influence. There, there really wasn't one that wasn't influenced by Hellenism one way or another. But, to, but I think that you're asking, was he more Hellenistic than he was Jewish? And again, I don't have any idea how we would measure such things. Um, so no, not really. We talk about in the book about Jesus having issues as portrayed in the Gospels with the Pharisees, Sadducees. And whatnot. Um, do you think that Jacob? I'm I'm sorry. I have sure. I have a son here who wants to be a famous YouTuber like you, <laughs> and uh and, and I told him he could he could be on just briefly because okay. it'd That's be fine. really cool. He was going to be on YouTube. Okay, bud. We close that. Sorry, you were saying about the okay. Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah. Um, do you think that Jesus historically actually might have had issues with them, or do you think this is um, just added to by the Gospels? No, I think historically he had he had issues with them because almost all Torah teachers had issues with other Torah teachers. So no, I don't. I, I mean, I think that the Gospels amplify things in certain circumstances. Uh, I think that uh, in in many circumstances, I think that. Um, you know, uh, that they put their own flavor on things. The, the gospel authors put their own distinctive spin on things. But I don't think that they're wholesale creating the notion that Jesus was in conflict with other teachers of Torah. 
You mentioned that the story of the adulteress in John 7, 53 to 8, 11 appears to have been added in the second or first century CE. Why do you think that's the case? Oh, thanks. Uh, that's because the earliest, the earliest manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of John don't have that story in there. Uh, we have uh, quite a few manuscripts that, that don't have it. The manuscripts that do have it have it in John 753 to 811. The earliest uh, hard evidence of that story being in the Gospel of John is Codex Bize uh, around uh, 400. Um, so we really don't have any hard evidence of it being in there earlier. The uh, but the patristic fathers that knew the story in the Gospel of John, they uh, they they're much later as well. They're fourth, fifth century. So we, you know, you you're left with this um, dilemma: Does it make more sense, given given the fragmentary nature of it, and that we we seem to have evidence of uh, earlier versions of it that aren't necessarily in the Gospel of John, and so the given the whole body of evidence you're asked you have to ask the question is it more likely that it was in there and someone took it out or is it more likely that uh it wasn't in there but somebody thought that it belonged there and put it in there and uh i think very strongly that the latter option is more likely that somebody put it in there thought it thought it belonged and put it in but it wasn't there in the earliest stages why do you think that the criteria that, that the criteria approach is on its way to its demise? Well, because uh, I think that what it's after doesn't exist. The criteria of authenticity were uh, it was a distinct method of approaching the historical historical Jesus that assumed that you could do away with or get behind or get through the interpretations of the earliest followers of Jesus. And you could get to something else, an earlier stage of the tradition or the historical Jesus himself in some cases. But the, the criteria of authenticity were these means to mitigate uh, the interpretive frameworks of the Gospels and get to something that was there earlier. And that's not how the past is packaged, whether whether it's a made up past or whether it's a historical past, an accurate past. Uh, the only way that the past survives is in the interpretive frameworks that people use in order to remember it. So for me, the the problem with the criteria of authenticity always has been that it's it's searching for a unicorn. It's it, it's it's not that it's not that they don't work anymore. It's that they never worked in the first place. So you think that it's a lot more difficult to weed out the historical aspects of Jesus than other scholars think? I, I'd say it differently. I think that thinking of it in terms of weeding out is the wrong way to think of it. I don't think that you can separate the tradition. If you look at the Gospels, I don't think you can separate it and to say, oh, this pile over here is historical and this pile over here is not historical. Now, that's a totally different claim than saying that um, there are things that happened in the Gospels and there are things that didn't happen in the Gospels. The, the latter set of circumstances is reflecting this, the, it's the status, its status as a judgment by a historian. I think X is more likely to have happened than not. I think Y is more likely not to have happened. Okay, that's my judgment as a historian. But the idea that we can go to the gospel tradition itself and like, you know, use some tool as a sieve and kind of get some nugget at the bottom and like, oh, that particular saying of Jesus or maybe that saying in Aramaic of Jesus or this particular circumstance. We know for sure that we can separate that from everything around it. It's that kind of thing that I think really does not work. Um, there's been a lot of productive scholars who think differently, who think they can do it. I don't think they can. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think it does. Um, now, why do you think that the late E.P. Sanders was overly skeptical? 
Oh, I call him overly skeptical about the historical origins of the controversy narratives. Uh, Sanders, uh, he's an interesting case, by the way, he just passed away. Um, so RIP Ed Sanders. Uh, he, Sanders thought it, it, in really interesting ways, he simultaneously tried to distance himself from the form critics and was a critic of the form critics. Uh, and then in other ways, he basically approached the Gospels exactly the way that the form critics did. And one of the ways that he approached them exactly like the form critics did was in his assessment of the controversy narratives, which are the stories where Jesus is in argument with other teachers. And Sanders basically repeated exactly what Rudolf Bultmann said, which was that they're all made up. They're they're completely the they're the. They're the figment of the imagination of the earliest followers of Jesus, that not a single bit of it was historical. And um, so my judgment in the book is, in Jesus Against the Scribal Elite is that, yes, certainly the earliest followers of Jesus thought about these with their own terms, with their own frameworks, their own ways of thinking things. But it was overly skeptical of Sanders to say that they were just free will making it up you know that because it's i think it's very likely and in fact it, it, it's very common in the judaism of jesus day for people to argue about the types of things that the gospels claim he was arguing with people about so i think jesus really had those battles and so sanders was overly skeptical about them but when you look at the gospels and you analyze them you think that in this case, there is essentially more history there than some think. And what's going on is, is that often, more often than not, the narratives are beefed up, added to rather than having to pick and choose what is historical, what's not. Well, what I would say is I, I am very comfortable affirming the historical likelihood that Jesus was in the kinds of discussions that the Gospels attribute to him. That's a different claim than saying, I know that this particular story from Mark 12 happened and that these were their exact words. I don't think we can say that type of thing. Uh, but the more general claim, what did Jesus get into arguments over the law, for example, with other teachers of the law? I, I, I have no problem at all saying, yeah, I think that's historically likely. So to scholars such as, uh, you know, the form critics or uh, any number of other scholars that think the church, the earliest followers of Jesus made these things up completely, none of it happened. I think that's kind of an absurd uh, claim. Uh, and, and it's very possible, in fact, I do, think, uh, uh, affirm that, yeah, they they most definitely cast them in their own language, their own thoughts. Did they put words into the mouth of Jesus? Did they put teachings into the mouth of Jesus? I'm sure that they did. Uh, I'm certain in certain instances that they did. But that's completely different from saying he never, he was never arguing with other teachers. Does it, does that answer your question? Yes. Do you think that Paul the Apostle was continuing could have could have been continuing the same battles with uh, debates regarding jewish law like jesus did in letters like galatians or do you think paul and jesus had deferring views when it came to uh, the jewish law well they had distinct views um it's hard to say because Jesus' actual teachings on the law where he would engage uh you know, he might expound a point of the law rather than point to it. Uh, he are pretty rare. Paul, on a number of occasions, though, will go in. I mean, he in Galatians, he uses allegory. Uh, in uh, you know, he he will go in and, and and expound on the law a little bit differently. I mean, Paul's discourse is you know, epistolary, whereas we read about Jesus in the Gospels in the form of narrative. So they're doing different things. Was Paul in 
similar debates? Yes. I think, though, that Paul stood on different ground. I think Paul actually was a scribal literate, authoritative teacher of the law, and Jesus probably wasn't. Um, so Paul, I think, when he enters into the debate, he, the debate, he probably does so on different terms and by standing in a different position than Jesus was. But of course, in Paul's own conception, he's not he's not greater than Jesus. But in terms of what we might call his qualifications, I think it's a pretty firm conclusion, at least in my mind, that Paul was a bit more educated than Jesus was. Hmm. Why do you think the four Gospels had differing views regarding Jesus's literacy? Mm, well, I mean, they have differing views on all kinds of different issues because they're written by different people. Uh, mm. So uh, I think that they have. Are, are you asking what evidence do I have for that claim or why is it that they have their own views? Why? Why is it they have their own views? Well, I think that to a certain extent, you can't escape the idea that uh, people see Jesus from their own context. I'm. I'm relatively convinced that Jesus sees uh, that Luke sees Jesus through the lens of Paul uh, and in the legend of Paul that Paul cert that Jesus certainly can't be less than Paul. And so Luke is, in my opinion, very uncomfortable with the idea of a Jesus that is that is scribal illiterate, that is not an authoritative teacher. Uh, so Luke is very comfortable with the idea that Jesus disagreed with other teachers in the law, but it's not because he wasn't one of them. Uh, so for Luke, he is, you know, Luke has Jesus show up in the temple at 12 and, and is basically teaching, uh, you know, Luke removes the idea that Jesus was a carpenter, a tectone, you know, Luke has Jesus ex expounding the law on the road to Emmaus, um, uh, with, uh, with the, with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So Luke, I think, uh, very much sees Jesus in some ways through the lens of Paul. He obviously sees Paul through the lens of Jesus, too. Uh, I think that Mark is much more comfortable with the idea that Jesus was not from within the authoritative circles. He was an outsider to scribal authority as it existed at the time. You know, uh, ex Matthew, I mean, a lot of scholars think that Matthew was uh, a scribal figure uh, himself. And so he likes the idea of Jesus as an authoritative scribal teacher. So it's only in Matthew that you have Jesus claim you have one teacher, uh, you know, this type of thing. But, you know, we can only speculate about these things because all we have are the Gospels in front of us. But I, those are some of my reasons you think that could be the reason why the author of the gospel of john decided not to comment rather if jesus was or wasn't literate because of these differing views i don't know to be honest with you all i know is that he 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 raises the issue more explicitly than anyone else and then he just leaves it sitting there hmm. he has he has audience jesus audience members explicitly ask about his literacy and then he never really answers it uh at least not in the terms that they ask it so um you know john it john is john's his own cat he does his own thing when you mentioned that the infancy gospel of thomas represents um an interesting affirmation of jesus capable of handling uh let me read um aff affirmation of both I, I meant to say affirmation of both mark scribal illiterate carpenter jesus and luke scribal literate jesus is this do you think this is the fnc gospel's way of trying to harmonize the two yeah yeah in in some ways i do i i think that the fnc gospel of thomas which as far as i'm concerned is like one of the most fascinating texts hmm. uh, of the first couple centuries uh I think that it's written very much to fill in narrative gaps in the received gospels at the time. The, you know, the gospels, the synoptics, what we would call the synoptics, especially. Uh, and, you know, in 
the infancy gospel of Thomas, Jesus is the son of a carpenter, explicitly so. That's That only happens in Mark's gospel and Matthew's mm-hmm. gospel. And Mark and Matthew both employ that language for Jesus while saying that Jesus got rejected as a synagogue teacher in his hometown. Uh, and then the infancy gospel of Thomas also explicitly narrates the the prelude to Jesus showing up in the temple at 12 to teach. That's where the story ends. And one of the narrative themes of the infancy gospel of Thomas in the second half is this idea that Jesus, Joseph uh, determines that Jesus is not going to remain illiterate. He will not allow Jesus to remain illiterate. But then there's all these hilarious stories about teachers trying to teach Jesus and then finding out that he can't be taught. But but it, it does it more explicitly in the imagery and language of literacy. You know, they're literally trying to teach him the out the Greek alphabet or in, uh, for example, pseudo Matthew, that version of the alphabet, uh, the alphabet logion. Uh, it's Hebrew. Uh, and, you know, in some cases he's learning Hebrew first and Greek. Uh, second and then it's or, or then it switched to others so this was that that uh, alpha beta logion was really popular uh, at that time and so we know that it's interested in it but the the fascinating thing is that in the infancy gospel of thomas jesus doesn't need it ends with the teacher basically admitting that uh, i i endeavored to teach you but i'm the one who needs to be taught so Jesus never actually gains literacy. You know, Joseph's mission of having Jesus taught literacy is never accomplished. And what the narrative ends with is this idea that Jesus didn't need it. So it's 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 a it's a fascinating thing uh, to me uh, based on this topic. But uh, yeah, basically, I think you're right. Uh, it's a it's some type of harmonization. I want to return to the subject of interpolation for a moment. Um, when I mentioned earlier about the about um, that the adultery that you believe the adultery scene in John was added to later, has that happened a lot in the four gospels where they added stuff often in the following centuries, or is this something that didn't really happen that much? Yes and no. Uh, yeah. Additions to the gospels happen all over the place all the time. I mean, if 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 you happen to have a Nestle all in uh, Greek New Testament, if you open it up and look at the bottom, or UBS New Testament, Greek New Testament, you open it up and look at the bottom of the page, and it's got all kinds of different textual variants. Uh, so, you know, we have over 6,000 manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, and none of them match each other, uh, another one exactly. So there were all kinds of additions and there were additions to the stories, you know, the most prominent ones. You know, John has some of the most prominent ones. John gets the story of the woman caught in adultery. In John 5, we get the story of the angel troubling the water. Uh, In Luke's gospel, the idea that Jesus sweat like blood was probably added later. Um, The end of Mark's gospel famously has two different endings. Uh, Well, three, uh, you know, what we perceive as the earliest and then two subsequent ones. So it happened all the time uh, in terms of stories being added. And there are particular manuscripts where it happens more often than uh, others. But the sophistication with which the story of the woman caught in adultery was added between John 7 and John 8, or the sophistication of, of the addition of the the longer ending of Mark's gospel to Mark is in something of a class of its own. It's a bigger block of text. It's a bigger block of narrative. And it's been done. Uh, not. It's not just like the addition of a phrase or, you know, a couple sentences, but this big block of narrative that, in my opinion, in both of those cases, has it's been added by people who were kind of paying attention to what they were doing. They understood the text that they were adding it to. Now, the the difference between the two is that in the story of the woman caught in adultery, I think it fits very it fits seamlessly in the Gospel of John where it was placed. 
and it and that that was by design. The person who put it there was paying attention to what was going on in the Gospel of John. The longer ending of Mark, it makes sense in Mark's gospel to an extent, but it's also this mishmash of some of it happens in in some of the things that show up there is from, are from Acts. You know, people have argued that some of it's from Hebrews. You know, it, it's more of like a canonical type of edition than it is just a Johannine edition. You mentioned that the transition away from scribal illiteracy began as early as Matthew and was completed as early as Luke. So are you saying that basically starting with Matthew and and then up to the time of Luke, Jesus's literacy, his cap his literary capabilities is upgraded over time? Yes, that is what I'm saying. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think they wanted to upgrade his literary capabilities? What is what do you think the theological purpose there might be? Well, theological, I, I also think that there's a, a sociological component here that's probably even stronger. I think that you had this emerging idea that Jesus was, as Matthew claims, the main teacher of his followers to the extent that they can't have any other teachers. And it's not a very far distance from the claim that I'm your only teacher to the claim that I am the best teacher. And if you believe that Jesus is the single best teacher, he has to be superior to other teachers. So you would remove and, and in case in, in, in Luke's case, they explicitly did. They removed ideas that would be detrimental to the idea that Jesus was a powerful teacher. Now, it has to be said they didn't have to. Mark's Jesus is a powerful teacher. He's just not an authoritative, socially recognized one, but he's still powerful, uh, you know. But for Luke, he wanted Jesus to have the right degrees and qualifications. And so, uh, you know, I, and and what else is happening? So you you have this trajectory of Jesus' prowess as a teacher growing and growing and growing. You know, until Clement will write Christ the pedagogue, you know, so it, it, it continues well beyond the Gospels as well. Um, and then but then you simultaneously have as devotion to Jesus spreads beyond Palestine and beyond Palestinian Judaism. And it comes in contact with the wider Greco-Roman world. We know that it was kind of laughed at, sneered at, not taken seriously. If you read uh, Chelsea's engagement with the Gospels, he's constantly kind of talking down his nose about him, like what kind of idiots could possibly believe this nonsense? And, you know, it, it's it's simultaneously this, you know, Christianity had become significant enough that Chelsea couldn't just ignore it. But when he chooses to engage it, what he chooses to do is expose it at all of its vulnerable points. And, you know, we know that they were vulnerable points because when Origen comes around in the next century and is still having to respond to Chelsea, he basically concedes uh, quite a bit of it and says, well, yeah, we're not really sophisticated folks, but that just proves the power of the Holy Spirit was present in, in us. And, you know, Justin Martyr, too, says, you know, we've got a lot of people in our assembly who are illiterate. Uh, so they weren't trying to hide this idea. So what I'm saying is, as devotion to Jesus spread out into more sophisticated circles that would despise it, I think I think it's pretty demonstrable that their portrayals of Jesus uh, enhanced his own intellectual and authoritative scribal uh, kind of qualifications uh, in order to safeguard against that criticism. So in other words, changes were made to Jesus, uh, depending on the text and where that text was written and to which audience it was written. Yes, more or less. But but we should but should, I should also say. This particular issue of Jesus literacy or scribal literate abilities is no different than any other issue. Any issue is written with. Uh, it is discussed and presented with a particular ideal audience in mind. Uh, 
in a particular set of socio-historical circumstances that that both enable and restrain the interpretive uh, act of narrativizing Jesus. So, you know, I, I am not one that thinks, oh, well, they were just, they were portraying Jesus the way it made sense to them. Yeah, and if they didn't, they wouldn't have portrayed him at all because you can't, you can't think about the past. You can't present it in any way other than how you can, uh, you know, so your interpretive frameworks are what enables the, the thoughts about Jesus. And it also provides some hermeneutical restraints on, on what you're going to say. So the, the issue of, you know, certain people thought certain things about Jesus because of their own sets of circumstances that's true for Jesus' literacy. That's true for his uh, their idea of Jesus as Messiah. That's true for their ideas about Jesus' relationship to God. There's true about how they interpret his teachings on divorce. It's true for everything. Circle back to uh, what I was asking you earlier about how does one discern from the exaggeration from history in the Gospels? You state that if no one... Uh, let me, let me reread that. If one is to use the Gospels as historical sources, then one must consider not just who Jesus was, but also who he was perceived to be by those around him. So um, what would your advice be to people that want to go into the Gospels to try to figure out what the historical Jesus was? I, I, apart from how the Gospels try to perceive him in light of their audiences? Right. That's a really good question. Thank you, Jacob. We're having fun here, aren't we? Yeah, we sure are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, that's a really good question. Uh, and I'll do it by circling back to the question you asked earlier about the criteria. So in for almost 100 years, the way that scholars answered that question was you have to sift historical tradition from later interpretation in the gospels and then you can pile up all the historic the stuff you think's historical and you can build an image of the historical jesus out of that stuff and leave everything else to the side so the first port of call under that method was to sift through the gospels right and and people invented different ways to sift at different times for me, the first port of call in answering historical questions about the Gospels is to ask, why did they think about Jesus in the way they did? Why might they have thought about Jesus in the way they did? All right. So instead of, for example, I think Mark and Luke present mutually exclusive claims about Jesus' scribal literate status. That's what this whole book, that whole book is about. They can't both be true. Jesus can't be a rejected synagogue teacher because he's a carpenter in Mark and a respected scribal literate figure who reads publicly in the synagogue, which is what happens in Luke. And they tell these in the exact same story. They can't both be true. So the, under a previous way of doing historical Jesus research, what you would determine at the outside is, outset is, oh, well, is one of these influenced by the early church? Okay, if, and whichever one's not influenced by the early church, that one's historical. That one's the one you go with. For me, that's nonsense because they're both influenced by the the early church. Luke had Luke's narrative agenda is driven by his theology just as much as Mark's. Mark isn't less theological or less Christological just because he's probably earlier. So, uh, in my opinion, if you start trying to strip away the theological interpretation of Jesus' earliest followers from the gospel tradition, you aren't left with anything. It's all their theological interpretation. That that and, and we have not yet answered the question of whether it could also be historical. So for me, the 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 initial question is not which one of these is historical and which isn't. It's well, why did each one think what they did? Why might they have? Uh, you know, and then when you start talking about the possible pressures and, and reasons that each of them would have thought what they did, then you start you can start imagining a historical scenario that explains. And this is what this whole book is. It's an attempt to imagine a historical scenario that explains how each of them came to the conclusions that they came 
already in the first century. All right, and and so you could say, for example, Jesus was not a scribal literate teacher. Luke totally made it up. But that doesn't actually answer the historical question. The historical question is, why did Luke make that up? And furthermore, once he made it up, why did it stick? You know, why why did why were people convinced of it? Luke could have said a lot of things about Jesus. He, he Luke could have claimed that Jesus stood up on a donkey and did a backflip. He doesn't do that. So why do certain claim? Even if Luke's making it completely up, why do certain things stick and they and others don't? Right. Um, and or you could say uh, Luke was totally right, and Mark made his completely up. That is an a historical. Uh, a historical, I'm, I'm not saying a historical, that is an historical explanation as well. Uh, for me, both of those were not nearly as persuasive as the idea that in his own day and time, Jesus was almost certainly perceived as both things by people who knew better and people who didn't know better. Uh, and that the reason that the that Mark's portrayal of Jesus and Luke's portrayal of Jesus sticks is because there was something about Jesus' actual life ministry teaching that gave resonance to both ideas. Do you think, I mean, what, what do you think of the viewpoint that there could there, there may be a viable way to reconstruct Jesus from hypothetical documents if you have a view on that like q like s some will say whatever is in q jesus said it and you got to by comparing matthew and luke you, you can figure it out and go from there looking at the alternating primitivity what, what do you think about that i think that there learned beautiful castles in the sky that you we don't i mean look i'm in the minority on this view i, I think it's a growing minority but it's a minority i we don't have q even if you reconstruct it out of matthew and luke when you're talking about historical questions you don't get appreciably further down the argumentative road than you would in just saying we have Matthew and Luke and let's work with their images, you know. And furthermore, I think that the idea of Q works under a particular model of gospel transmission that, again, when it gets cast into the tone of historical inquiry, it assumes that you can get back to something earlier, that you can get through, beyond, on the other side of, underneath, whatever spatial metaphor we want to use. It assumes you can get to something previously. I have less confidence that we know that. I have way less confidence that we know that more than we know what we actually have in front of us, the manuscripts we actually have preserved. So just as a matter of uh, as a matter of uh, argumentative practice, I prefer to base my discussions on sources that we actually have. Now, I want to be really clear here, though. I don't think that positing Q is illegitimate. It's I think that it's I've said in print, I think it's large scale conjectural emendation. I think that it's totally legitimate as a theory. Uh, and there, I know many people who are extremely bright scholars I have learned a lot from who affirm Q. And I have learned from their studies on Q. So that's not, so I'm not, I'm also not bashing the people who do it. It's just not the way that I want to do it. Thanks for joining me today, Professor Keith. Thanks for having me. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe, 
and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.